नमस्ते एवरीवन वेलकम टू द चार वक पॉडकास्ट दिस इज योर होस्ट कुशल मेहरा माय गेस्ट टुडे इज समवन आई हैव बीन रीडिंग पर्सनली एट अ पर्सनल लेवल फ्रॉम 2010 समवन आई हैव एडमायर्ड यू कैन आल्सो कॉल मी अ फैन uh i i am a fan of arvindan nilkandan and today it is my personal honor and pleasure because believe me uh, arvindan <laughs> barely comes out and speaks with people but i'm happy that today we are talking about arvindan's book hindutva origin evolution and future so it is once again i with all seriousness arvindan it's my personal honor to get you on the podcast i've always admired your work so thank you very much for coming namaste and the respect is mutual so let's start with this we were just talking offline you have been like you have been a consistent writer uh, many people at least uh, in my side of the reading world if, if i would say came across you you know when you were co- the co-author of breaking india with rajiv malhotra ji at that time uh, i came across and then since then uh, i have been always reading you right every even today when you write something in swaraj it's like a second nature for me uh, what has arvindan written uh, <laughs> what arvindan has to say or if it's a book review at times i remember you had uh, recently written a review of richard dawkins book also uh, i i forgot the name of the book but i remember reading the review i'm very bad with names and i remember dawkins had all dawkins has also plucked that uh, review which you had uh, video written but so my first question arvindan to you is this how did you become such a prolific writer what does one do to be like you how can you write so well and so long um the only reason i write is because of my hindutva wow so i don't consider myself a writer or an intellectual or anything thinker nothing of that sort i am a hindutvite and i want to contribute to this process called hindutva in a positive way so i do this so whatever i read i it uh, as you said about uh, talking about the second nature whatever i read i always think that how this is related to hindutva how this can enrich in hindutva how this can contribute to hindutva that is how i see things so naturally i get into all the things everything in the world attracts me whether it is a book by fricho capra or whether it is a book by richard dawkins whether it is evolution or whether it is consciousness studies whether it is environment whether it is local communal problem whether it is terrorism i get attracted to everything but the central axis is always hindutva so now this is a very interesting way of actually looking at hindutva itself and this connects me to your book because you have clearly called your book very specifically origin evolution and future and you start the book itself uh, in a very interesting way where you explain um, you know how does one you know define the term see everybody tries to define hindutva you try to define hinduism hindu and hindutva in a in a three pronged way in the book so let's work over there first i i want to ask you how did you come up with this this concept because savarkar had uh, said that uh, there is a difference between hindutva and hinduism i think vikram sampath also mentioned a few of the quotes that savarkar had used but you have taken a completely different approach to the evolution of hinduism hindutva at a conceptual level where where you talk about uh, let's say as you know in some cases you talk about archaeology and neuroscience you use examples from archaeology and neuroscience you also talk about certain developments at the level of consciousness at how certain ideas forms mimetic changes or we could call them mimetic changes so i want you to first start that why did you look at this in a three pronged way actually um, here i wo the complete concept to veer savarkar because savarkar points out that what is very unique about india what is the most unique most important contribution of india to the world civilization savarkar very clearly says that we are not physically different 
we are not uh, in terms of being a society we are not very different from other cultures and other civilizations and other uh, so called ethnic groups he is very clear about that but he points out to this he says that india discovered this uh, kundalini and he says that this is the the highest possible bliss that a human being is entitled to irrespective of his race gender belief system etc and hence this represents the essence of indian culture something that we have to guard and we have to share it to the world and ultimately this is how savarkar ends uh, uh, his essentials of hindutva that at the height of a person's hinduness the person ceases to be a hindu he or she embraces the entire universe as its own her own motherland so at another at another level that you pointed out he says that hinduism is essentially a kind of a subset of this universal hindutva so i have brought i this these ideas that uh, actually gave that conceptual framework for the first chapter that you are talking about so we have here a discovery of uh, a, the achievement the maximum the maximized achievement of human potential a discovery of this and a civilization predicated itself upon this that is the the uniqueness of uh, hindu culture and hence it has to live so that this can be shared with all humanity it can be shared and it can enrich an all humanity that is the purpose of this culture so we have to preserve this we have to nurture it nourish it and take it forward so all these three things the term hindu the term hindutva the term hindu dharma they all thus unite at this point how mm. we can enrich humanity now let us focus on two things in your book i'm going to read two excerpts over here from your book in this the first chapter i will have to focus a lot on the first chapter because uh to me that is a very important essence of your book because until and unless people don't get the first chapter because that is the theoretical foundation and the theoretical basis of the chapters further ahead on on the basis of which you uh, you know you build the book as they say now you, there are two specific yes. so you say as we will be seen soon the ritual and the spiritual coevolved in india with organic linkages no doubt necessitated by factors that were socio ecological cultural what and what can be deemed spiritual the vedic concept of ritha that formed the basis of the ritual universe of vedic society created a seamless transition by mapping itself with the developments of the notion of brahman and atman this is one this is the one that uh, i want to and now i want to talk about something else because this also i was very fascinated by because these, these are things that i have myself as i dabble in philosophy as a humble student of philosophy i think about these things all the time because it's kind of in the in my realm you have written what one finds in the indic context is then this the bicameral mind rather than breaking down gets integrated into a thorough holistic self through a systematic cultivation of inner disciplines this is well attested in harappan iconography as well as in the vedic literature in harappan iconography we find horned animals and deities on many seals most of these seals can be definitely categorized as belonging to the bicameral era if viewed from the jainism perspective however the horn deity systematically evolved into an introspective deity before we talk about anything first can you for the benefit of my viewers and listeners explain what is a jainism perspective so that they get a theoretical build up on what you know jainismism is what what was he looking at how did he look at evolution of societies at a fundamental level and then i'll ask you the follow up question right now julian james is a very was a very interesting american psychologist he came up with this wonderful idea wonderful concept that uh, we our civilization got guided by some kind of auditory hallucinations between the two hemispheres 
the two hemispheres were actually uh, connected by the corpus callosum, as we all know, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And one is associated with uh, logical uh, thinking and another with the creative intuitive thinking. And the intuitive thinking always was like a voice. And even today, we have inner dialogues. Even today, even for some very small things like going to a shop, we have an inner dialogue. But we know that this inner dialogue is being conducted between the two aspects of the same self. They are not two different entities. But there are people where this, this intuitive voice is very, very strong, like the voice of the case of prophets. And so they were able to hear the deity and then they were able to give guidance. And this kind of was an important civilizational uh, force, the starting of the human uh, civilization. But as human civilization became more and more complex, the urban pressures started uh, acting upon this. And then this bicameral mind broke down and a kind of you know, consciousness rose. And the, 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 the gods stopped talking. Or the dominant gods' talk alone would be considered as positive. All other voices of gods would, were just suppressed. This is how monotheism arose. That is what Julian James gave, told. So this was the concept of Julian James. The problem with the idea of Julian James is that despite the fact that this was a very path-breaking way of looking at things, very uh, inter I would say that he had broken completely a new ground. You can look at the ancient archaeological aspects from the point of view of uh, uh, neuroscience. So he was a great pioneer and like all pioneers, he had uh, shortcomings. From hindsight, we can say that. And so one of the things was that he was extremely Eurocentric. He dismisses India with a few lines. And another one aspect is that he was seeing it only from the monotheistic framework. So he saw how the monotheism evolved out of this. But what I found, when I read Julian James, I, I thought that this is a very wonderful work, a great framework. Then when I read Ram Swarup, I found out that Ram Swarup independently had traced the same kind of uh, evolution in Indian context in a much better and a holistic way. So I put them side by side and I could see a development. Now, in the case of uh, what Julian James says, for example, is that uh, you don't have a concept of self. Naturally, you don't have a concept of uh, an inner journey or a kind of uh, practices like meditation, etc. They all evolved at the so-called axial age, like around 700 BCE or something. And from a typical intellectual point of view, you can see that they coincide with the Venetian period as the if typical Indologists say. Now, if you look at even people who are sympathetic to uh, Indian philosophy, like Dr. S. Radhakrishnan, a great person, a great scholar, you will find that they would talk about uh, Rigvedic times as a kind of uh, very um, primitive uh, nature-based worship. Kind of, uh, there is this uh, uh, primordial joy, etc. But not very deep philosophical contemplation or anything. But in the in Upanishads, you find a lot of contemplation, a lot of questions, even questioning the authority. And in between, you have something called a spiritual, something called a kind of a ritual uh, uh, indergnam. So they would uh, suggest that these Aryans came, okay, Aryans came or whoever created this uh, Vedic civilization, they came. And then uh, they created a priestly social structure after interacting with the people here. They created this. And then the intuitive people, the people who were intelligent, they started asking, the rebellious people, they started asking questions about this system and that was the Upanishad period. And then Buddhism came. So you have this wonderful linear structure in which you have this primordial nature worship and you have the priestly class structure and you have this rebellious spiritual phase. But when you go through this Janitian as well as Ramsurup's model, which is far better, you find that inner contemplation is there already in Vedic period. This so-called bicameral mind, you can actually see it in the Vedic period in the form of the, 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 the parable of the two birds. One bird is looking at 
and the other bird is eating. But they both, at one particular point of time, they realize that they are one. This is exactly what bicameral mind actually is. So what the Indian culture did was that it created an unity instead of an unit. It didn't create a monotheistic unit. It created an unity and on the unity, it was able to accommodate diversity. This unity in diversity that as well as the capacity to go inward and experience the self, they became the hallmark of Indian civilization. Here I hypothesize that at this particular point of time, the bicameral mind breakdown didn't happen in only this way in India. It, the, the unit also arose. Monotheism also arose. And with monotheism also came a binary look of the good voice and the bad voice. So the good voice was Agura Masta, the bad voice was Agriman and the people who didn't listen to the good voice, they were considered as bad people. So this split came. Naturally, these people had to move away. They moved into Iran and then they said that, okay, these people are, they belong to a particular geographical region and also they belong to a particular spiritual uh, vision. So those people were called Hindu and the Hindu is also having relation to the word Hindu, which is related to uh, the Sindhu river and also Soma. In Rigvedic uh, river Sukta, you find uh, that uh, Susoma is a term that is used for one of the branches of Sindhu river, not to any other river. And Hindu is the drop of the Soma that is mentioned in Rigveda. Now, as you know, Hindu is also related to moon. Hindu is also related to mind. Soma is also related to moon. And Soma is related to Sindhu. All these come together. Then we cannot say that the term Hindu or Hindu is a corruption of the Sindhu river as called by uh, foreigners. This is a term, a spiritual and a geographic term that evolved within the very clear Vedic Indian context. So this is the basis of the Janitian, or I would say rather Ramsvarup framework, or Janitian yeah. Ramsvarup framework. All right. Now, now let's talk about this because uh, this is what uh, I think. Uh, basically, Zoroastrianism, or uh, whatever we want to call it, being proto-monotheistic uh, thought, is it uh, even now? Even in it, I think Western academia is pretty much as the accepting of that. Right? They they do consider. Uh, uh, Zoroastrianism to be the first proto-monotheistic idea and through that uh, they believe that monotheism arose out of that too, right? Uh, I, there is a small change. I would say that uh, Judaism is essentially monotheistic. It was doing their exile to Persian region that they learn about a monotheistic religion with uh, a binary element in it. So what actually our uh, Zoroastrian brothers contributed to the world civilization was this concept of Saturn. So you have a God and you have an anti-God. Either you are with a God or you are with the anti-God. And in fact, one of the earliest inscriptions that talks about the Hindu, it also talks about uh, temple demolitions. I demolished the temples of the devas and I installed uh, this uh, great Agura Masta. Mm -hmm. You just remove that and you put another one term like uh, Allah, then you would have a typical Allahuddin Gilji statement. Okay, so you have this. This, this binary is what Zoroastrian religion gave to Islam and Christianity. Judaism, even Judaism, the fringe elements took it. And after that, it was made into a full-blown concept in Christianity and Islam. So that is what actually Zoroastrianism uh, contributed to the monotheistic religion. The, the Zoroastrian religion created a branch in Judaism which moved from monotheism to mono, I would say, monopolistic religion. So Christianity is a monopolistic religion. Judaism is a monotheistic religion. So, Rashianism is, as you rightly said, proto, not monotheistic, proto monopolistic culture. Now, what, the, at an evolutionary level, of, of, when we look at the evolution of memes, as you said, let's say there was a common seed and 
the seed leads to multiple branches two being the ones we just discussed one remained in india one went further ahead in the iranian uh, further area and or whatever areas we want to call them and then what could be the possible factors that lead to these divergent mimetic changes in your opinion uh, was it like certain geographic conditions like what were the reasons for this i think uh, the reasons are not the reasons are not uh, geographic conditions rather it is that there is a there is a component in our psyche that gets attracted to monotheism that get attracted to this binary splitting of things it is very easy it is dogmatic and uh, there is a book called gnostic gospels uh, written by elaine pagels who is a very great uh, academician and she says that uh, the politics of monotheism is that there is one be one god one bishop naturally one king hmm. okay so it is easy to control people monotheism is all about giving you the religion of hope in the other world and controlling masses and that is the dream of every ruler that is the dream of every uh, politician so naturally there is a great attraction to monotheism and this monotheistic tendencies as well as monopolistic tendencies can always arise in different uh, cultures including indian culture Mm-hmm. in indian culture also we have we have got jealous gods okay gods like creator gods and jealous gods sky gods but always you find that this sky gods jealous gods creator gods they get tamed by this unity brahman so you have in bhagavatam this wonderful episode where brahma comes and challenges krishna it is the creator god that comes and challenges krishna uh in skanda purana you have the creator god uh, getting knocked down by skanda when he cannot explain the mystery of creation so all these things point to one particular aspect that aspect is that this creator god or jealous gods or the ego gods as ramsuru calls them those gods got accommodated or got or shown their place in the greater vast map spiritual map of the brahman unity and this perhaps existed in a lot of pagan cultures today it exists only in india the monotheistic uh, religion or rather the monopolistic religions have taken over the entire world civilization they have become the dominant force but we are this rare endangered but precious aspect of human psyche that is what makes hindutva important so so now i take you to chapter 8 if i remember correctly so i guess the reason hindutva survives is because of that uniqueness which you i think samanvay then would that samanvaya. be one of the major yeah samanvaya right? yes yes samanvaya is a process now the western philosophy has this process called dialectics yes dialectics is a cartesian mechanistic process samanvaya is an organic process so in samanvaya what we do is that we realize that if for example you see a lot of people happy after a christian mass or a person feels an inner peace and comfort after a namaz right you don't have to buy the theology you don't have to buy the belief system but you have to explain that inner peace that inner peace comes from his movement towards the brahman okay making that inner experience the basis for dialogue the hindutva process starts having dialogues with all the religions so this at once is able to create a connect at the same time it stops the expansionist movement from there on the other hand if you look at the dialogues that are started by christianity or islam the you can see a sagir nayak or you can see the church calling you for dialogue you will find that they will focus on the externals 
they will focus on a kind of a superficial unity they will focus on history whereas the hindu dialogue process it is informal process but it has been happening throughout the civilization and it has created a lot of examples they connect through the inner experience and that is samanvaya so the samanvaya is a very strong organic process at the same time it is not very easy to define protocols for this now here, here's here's where we run into problems and yeah. i'll connect it so bear me for a while in the it's almost in the middle of the book where you say while christians muslims and parsis are communities in india hindus are a nation are the nation they must remember this they cannot behave in a way similar to other communities so each time a hindutvite particularly of the neo net variety i i love the use of the term neo net variety here takes up the argument of quote why shouldn't we imitate the islamist fundamentalist or a christian fanatic in securing a ban on a book or movie as a power statement one needs to remember that hindus in india are not a community but the nation now i wanted to read this because now i will share my thoughts and i'll build the question up this is the crux from even if i look at it from a popperian perspective right uh the popperian paradox from that perspective the the problem is that as you rightly said that we are built on at a mimetic level whether it's the chatushkoti way of looking at it or the anekantvad way of looking at it where yes we don't become absolute relativist but we say we are more flexible but then here comes the popperian perspective too that how does hindutva while protecting its own essence of diversity of samanvaya also deal with these very real world issues arvindan because whether we agree with it or not these are real world issues right where if we were to let's say uh, look at it holistically that what if something goes wrong and how far can we let this samanvaya happen where minorities in india do get the opportunity to prosper and practice their religion but also at the same time it does not harm our own nature so what do you how do we create that balance is my question well um in this book if you look at the the section that deals with uh, islam with respect to samanvaya you will find that at one particular point of time a person may even think that what is this this almost goes into this typical pseudo secular variety okay and if you look at the subsequent chapter you will find sub- subsequent sections you will find that i have also shown what are all the strong terrorist activities and nexuses that islamism is creating okay so what goes against samanvaya is monopolistic expansionism expansionism of monocultures so when there is an expansionism of monoculture naturally the hindutva becomes the resisting force it is very organic so we resist conversion very strongly but we never allow that to become a kind of hatred that the jew that the nazis had for jews we have strong resistance against the like expansionist islamist attacks and jihad but at the same time we don't allow that to become hatred towards an ordinary muslim who is my neighbor so this is a very very strong path where uh, we have to fight without hatred we fight expansionism at the same time we recognize the human worth i will give you a very clear example of this whenever people talk about golwalkar they always quote one one thing golwalkar said in 1939 that if uh, minorities want to live in india they should respect hindu culture otherwise they can't even have ordinary human rights this is the quote they always use but there is also another one quotation that i have used here another one passage from a letter that golwalkar wrote to the functionaries of the sank and it was published after 
Golwalkar died a good many years after Golwalkar died by a senior Karyakarta when he was publishing all his letters, the letters that Golwalkar had written. And he says this, whenever you have to serve a human being, you have to serve him without thinking about the jati or the religion or the caste or the race or whatever, gender, nothing. Whether it is a, this is what he, the words he uses. Um, whether it is a Christian or a Muslim, when you are serving, you have to serve the us serving the holiest of the holy idol that was placed inside the sanctum sanctorum of the temple, because it is the same the divine essence that is in that temple that is residing in this human being. So that human being has actually given you an opportunity to serve him. So you are serving him. Now you take both these, both these statements. One statement was told when this partition was happening and all this Islamic uh, separatism was at its zenith. Hatred against Hindus was at its zenith and uh, genocidal attacks were being made on Hindus in uh, Western Punjab and East Bengal. At that time, he makes this statement. The same person makes this statement in the context of giving guidelines to his Karyakartas. So, we understand when we deal with the person, when we fight that particular expansionist tendencies, which we have to fight without any compromise, when we fight that, we have to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of hatred. Often this happens. Uh, you naturally tell uh, some bad, there are some bad names for every each and every community. For Brahmins, there is some bad words. And for Dalits, there is some for every Jati, there will be a bad uh, name given to it by other communities. Sometimes we end up using those words for uh, Christians and Muslims. And every Hindutva leader had made clearly told us that you should refrain from it. You shouldn't do that. You have to think of them as children of India. You have to think of them as the Amrdasya Butra. That is how you have to think of them. At the same time, you have to fight against expansionism. Now, that is how Samanvaya happens. And Samanvaya, as again I said, it is not an institutional process. It is an individual process. And when we understand this at the conceptual level, it helps us clearly to do it. Savarkar used to do it. For example, Savarkar said to his fellow Hindu Mahasabhai people that they should invite non-Hindus to the, their festivals like Navratri and others. You should invite them and let them see this culture. They have been taken away from this culture for historical reasons. Let them see this culture, then naturally there will be a transformation. It may take generations, but it will take, it will happen. Fair enough, fair enough. Now I want to go into a very specific part of the book. Uh, I just think it's a very important fact that we should be talking about and you should speak before I jump into the biggest one, which is Jati Varna or caste as whichever you want to call it. And that's, uh, that's, but I want to talk about the Janagana one of it. Can you, can you share and clear and clarify the information? Because uh, you have, um, you have used a very particular word in your book. I, I, I crack up every time I, I read, uh, I even think about it. You call it cargo cult. <laughs> Hindutva. <laughs> it's just an amazing word that you've, uh, because I remember you had written about this in Swarajya also. So even in this, what you have loosely called the cargo cult Hindutva world, I have seen many WhatsApp forwards that state uh, Rabindranath Tagore writing Janaganamana for the Queen, etc, etc. Can we once and for all clarify what was it written for, please, through this podcast? Yeah, sure. Um... So, uh, Janakana Mana was uh, a beautiful poem that uh, Tagore wrote when he was in, if I am right, Andhra Pradesh. One morning he has this inspiration and he writes this. And when people wanted to uh, replace Vande Mataram, or they wanted to somehow this Vande Mataram, they are suggesting Janakana Mana. But naturally, um, there is always a great hesitancy on the part of the so-called secular people towards Divine Feminine. Because Divine, Divine Feminine is uh, very closely related to or is connected to this 
concept called unity. It is related to the concept of Kundalini. It is related to the concept of Samanvaya. It is related to Avyakta. So naturally, the dominant Abrahamic uh, mindset, it or expansionist mindset rather than Abrahamic, I would say the dominant monopolistic expansionist mindset, it always wanted to suppress the divine feminine. So they thought that Janakanamana looks very clearly like a personal God, addressed to a personal God. Let us use this in this place. And it was also a very great spiritual uh, song. But it was not used for uh, welcoming any emperor or anything. It was not written for that purpose. Uh, Rabindranath Tagore has very clearly stated that. Now, in the third stanza of uh, Janaganamana, Janaganamana talks about uh, Hey Shira Sarati. Your Radha Chakra is reverberating through day and night in this land. And your sacred conch shell, the sound of your sacred conch shell, it removes all the fears. It, you can hear this sacred conch shell amidst the riots and uh, confusions and chaos, but it removes all the fears. Now, you can very clearly identify whom he was talking about, right? So you have the Radha Sarathi and the conscious sound that removes the fear and confusion amidst all the rebellions. So you can very clearly identify the person whom he was talking about, Krishna. But that is not alone important. Then in the next uh, verse, in the next stanza, he talks about Sneha Mayi Mata, whose eyes are unblinking, always taking care of the children. Even in the dark night, she is taking care of the children. So you have here the image of Krishna on the one side, you have here the image of the goddess on the other side. And coming from Tamil Nadu, I remember specific, very specific stanza that talks about the form of Shiva as being made of half form Vishnu, half form Sati and totally feminine. This was sung in 5th century CE in Tamil Nadu and you have here in 20th century uh, Rabindranath Tagore Gurudev talking about the same form and he sees this as Varada Bhagavidatha. So very clearly, Rabindranath Tagore was not talking about the British colonial rule. Rather, he was giving the essence of India's spirituality in that song. In fact, if somebody thought Vande Madhuram was a kufur and they were against it, this is thousand times more kufur. They think that that was very Hindu. This is thousand times more Hindu most strongly Hindu. So that is what uh, Janaganamana is actually. Now, now let's get into the biggest, uh, uh, as they say, elephant in the room, which is always about caste or jati, varna, how, however people want to define it. I mean, I just look at all these things personally as hierarchies, so systems of hierarchies that exist everywhere in the world. And India created hierarchies in the form of jati, varna, uh, whether it's Plato, and Plato's Republic, it has a three-tier hierarchy system. There are different cultures who have practiced hierarchies. Even today, humanity has hierarchies, whether we want to admit to it, the, with varying levels of fluidity in those hierarchies. Now, the standard accusation on Hindutva or Hindutvites or Hindutva ideologues is that they are upper caste perpetrators of Brahminism that puts Brahmins at the top and everything else at the bottom. Now, you, you, you copiously quote Savarkar and many other, you know, thinkers when it comes to this whole Jati Varna debate. Now, you know, those things have been done. I want to talk about something completely different from for this issue. Arvindan, how do they, when I say they, it's very important to explain they too. How do these people who accuse Hindutva of these things get away with something like this. That is what I want to understand. The quotations are there. Savarkar's views are there. For example, the seven shackles of Hindu society. I mean, what can be more anti-casteism in terms of statement than that? Or for example, you know, you, you quote uh, 
Guruji, Guru Golwalkar, in the entire uh, uh, book, you say, you know, Guru Golwalkar says, well, I have told you once that for the sake of construction of a new house, old house requires to be destroyed. Similarly, perturbed social system must be put to an end here and now and should be destroyed root and branch. Going further, we should proceed to establish a pure and harmonious society on the basis of pure nationalism. Now, there are so many such statements that are existing in the, you know, in the in the internet world or in academic work. But how the hell have we not managed to still make overtures then? I will tell you why. Um, you know, the answer was given by Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar, as you know, Datopan Tenkiti, who was the founder of uh, Bharatiya Mastursang, who was a RSS full-time worker, he was an assistant of uh, Dr. Ambedkar. They were having a conversation. And then uh, Dr. Ambedkar was at that time talking about getting converted to Buddhism, going away from Hinduism and all that. And then uh, Datopan Tenkiti, he said to Dr. Ambedkar, at that time he was a very uh, a young boy at that time, and he told uh, Dr. Ambedkar, uh, but you know, in RSS, there is no Jadi, Varna, we don't uh, practice untouchability, we don't accept untouchability, we don't accept birth-based uh, uh, Jadi system. So, but then Dr. Ambedkar said, but you people are a minority. Then Tengiriji said, right, but today we are a minority, tomorrow we will become majority, everywhere there will be Shagas, a lot of people will become Swayam Sevas, we will be the majority. Dr. Ambedkar smiled and said, that is not what I meant. What I meant was, tomorrow, if your Guruji Golvalkar says, untouchability is not there in the Shastras, and then a Sangracharya says that untouchability is there in the Shastras, whom do you think the Hindu society would accept? In terms of authority, they are the majority. So whatever change that you are making, you may become numerical majority, but still, what the Dharmacharya says would uh, be considered as what Hinduism, Hindu Dharma says. So that is the point where we, the point that the society had reached. It was not like that before the colonial time. It did, almost you will find very interesting that almost all these Dharmacharyas, they are uh, hold on uh, the Hindu society or rather let us say uh, the, the scriptural or Shastric authority, it all solidified during the period of 1858 to 1947 and it is going on. So naturally, if I am your enemy and I want to destroy you, I would find what is your weakest point and the Hindu society's weakest point is this. This mental disease called the Shastra based, birth based Varna and untouchability social hierarchy and social exclusion and then mapping it to Sanadana Dharma and telling that this is Dharma. This is Dharma. When, when an Acharyas say that and you tell that you are going to defend Sanadana Dharma by which you mean the Sanadana Dharma of Swami Vegananda and Sri Aurobindo, Sanadana Dharma of Veer Savarka, Sanadana Dharma of the Vedas, Jaladana Dharma of the Bhakti Saints, the term becomes loaded. They tell that by Sanadana Dharma, you mean what your Dharmacharyas say. And what your Dharmacharyas say? They say that, well, I don't have to quote that person again, right? We all know whom I am talking about. Absolutely, we know. So, this is the problem that we are having. And Golvalkar again tried to change that. He got all the Dharmacharyas who were willing on the same days, then he made an IAS officer who belonged, the Dharmacharyas didn't move the resolution. An IAS officer who belonged to scheduled community in 1960s, he made the resolution, he passes the resolution, he makes, he reads the resolution telling that there is no place for untouchables in our sastras. All the Hindus are equal. No Hindu can be considered as, as uh, depressed or a suppressed community person and all the Dhammacharyas endorse that and say yes from the, the days. So that was a historical moment. Unfortunately, that we should have moved forward from that. 
Sangha has always been moving forward from that. Unfortunately, yes, Sangracharya comes and he makes a statement, or another Dhammacharya comes and he makes a statement, and that statement grabs the limelight. And these forces that want to identify us with the so-called Brahmanism, these forces have their own vested interest. Without Jadi, they cannot live. Yeah. And you know what the ironical thing is? I read a quote from your book of Guru Golwalkar. And you can now check the latest speech made by the current Sar Sangchalak, uh, Shri Mohan Bhagwat. And he also says the same thing. He, you know, he said it in Hindi that uh, we have to get rid of this entire system of uh, Jati Varna. It has gone well past its, uh, 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 you know, usability date. And this is the tussle, right? The few, and, and I always say this, that Hindutva is not just a struggle against Islamism. I, and I use Islamism as a product, which is political Islam in a very specific way, or imperialism, which is part Western, part colonial, mixed with uh, their own absurd uh, secular uh, tendencies or Marxism, add everything in that, you know, and just put it in a dabba and just <laughs> can put it. But at the same time, Hindutva also is a response in a very political and societal, social and political sense to this Jati Varna conundrum that we are facing in the society. And you rightfully said that. I, I, and I remember that exchange from your book also between um, uh, Dr. Ambedkar and Dattupan Thingdi Ji, uh, where uh, he says that, how are you going to solve it? Because if, 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 the, if the head of the religious head says it, I mean, honestly, you can't. And, and I... If you remember, even during the first resolution being passed, there was resistance from certain yes. gurus. They resisted. The kudos to the RSS and, and the overall Hindutva movement that basically, I would not say waltz over, but pretty much waltz over <laughs> the, the, the dissenting voices. And they said, no, you have to sign this. But let's say over a period of this uh, entire movement, if I was to ask you, Arvindan, uh, first I'll state my view. I think we are actually winning the battle against this uh, entire uh, untouchability or Jati Varna, uh, birth-based Jati Varna movement. We are actually winning. This is my personal view. But what do you make of uh, Hindutva's performance? If I was to say, if you were to give Hindutva marks for this. Well, um, this is this fight against Jati this fight against, let us say, birth-based social hierarchies. Thank you. It is one of the defining features of Hindutva. Okay, in my, my view. Throughout the world, there have been birth-based social hierarchies. Throughout the world, there have been birth-based social exclusions. How did they remove those social exclusions or how did they make them invisible at least? The entire Europe could make it invisible by becoming a great colonial uh, expansionist force. So, when you have such amount of resources, for example, you take Australia, Australia is nine times India. All those resources, all that land is available to you and you removed all your criminal families into Australia. The same way, entire America has been taken, America is so huge. So this much amount of resources have been flowing into your uh, uh, civilization, then you can make the, the birth-based social hierarchies and birth-based social exclusions invisible or less um, harmful. You have done that. But for that, you imported the extreme human misery to Africans and other native cultures. That is how you removed and you made yourself look egalitarian. Whereas in the case of India, we have been fighting against these social hierarchies through our spiritual force alone. So they removed their social hierarchies when they could. We remove, we are striving to remove our social hierarchies and our social exclusions through our spiritual strength. Despite the fact that at that time we were going through this shrinkage of resources, we were going through the shrinkage of the geographical area where we were living 
and increase in the population. We were undergoing ex ex exactly the reverse process of what was happening in Europe what was happening to the European civilization. So they became liberal. Naturally, when your resources shrink, when your populations increase, when your geographical area shrinks, then the social hierarchies become more rigid. Yet, we have been able to go, we have been able to win the battle, as you rightly said, over this social, uh, the rigidity of the social hierarchies, and we have been able to fight social exclusions. The point is, why, how we are doing this? We have been doing this throughout our history, right from the Vedic times. So when you take when you talk about Vedic times, I always stress this. You have to make a distinction between the Vedic society and the Vedic values. Vedic society was like any other society with the all kind of human ambitions, human greed, human good nature, everything. So there were social hierarchies and social exclusions. There is this wonderful story that is that is recorded in Sadhavada Brahmana where you have Kavachaga, a great uh, Rishi, who was the son of a woman who was working in the gambling house, but he was a great Rishi. He was there to perform a yajna and the other people who had uh, come there, they said, this guy is actually a Brahmana. The word Abrahmana itself is used there. This guy is an Abrahmana, let, let us throw him out. So they throw him out and after that he becomes a mantra drishya in that moment of extreme tension and humiliation. He becomes mantra drishya, Saraswati comes. Saraswati starts flowing around him. So you have here a clear distinction between what is Vedic culture and what is, what is Vedic society and what is Vedic values. Vedic society was having social stratifications just like any other society of that time. Whether it was Europe or whether... At that time, European civilization was not there. Let us say Egyptian or Mesopotamian or Chinese, they all had social stratifications. Vedic society also had social stratifications, but anywhere else, voice against social stratification was not heard. It is only in the Hindu society that the voice against social stratification and social exclusion had been heard again and again and again. Whether it is Randideva, whether it is uh, the Bhakti saints, Turingana Samantha, you hear this voice against social stratification continuously in the Hindu society. That is another one important strand of Hindutva. And today, the RSS represents that. Today, the Hindutva movement represents that. The tradition, the so called traditionalist, that is why I wrote the term colonial traditionalist, and people got extremely angry. They are the colonial traditionalists. They represent the colonial perception of Hindu Dharma. Whereas we represent the actual Dharmic strand. The reformist represents the actual Dharmic strand. Yeah, and that's that's the tussle, uh, tussle between uh, the Hindu society internally, where uh, who, 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 who has Dharma? Or who speaks for dharma in that sense? Who who is truly on the right side on this one? And very interestingly, in your book, the two chapters, the biggest chapters are chapter four, I remember, which is on racism, casteism, and all these social emancipation things, and and which is chapter six, which is on RSS. I believe these are the two biggest chapters of your of your book. But uh, Arvind, then before we wrap it up, I think we have to talk about this too, where you have a chapter on science and Hindutva. Now, full disclosure, this is one of my pet peeves with the Hindutva movement. I don't know how to say it. And good that you have segregated this, that there is cargo cult Hindutva. You do talk about cargo cult leftism too in the chapter 2. And I and am fully aware of that. And I want to tell the people that, yes, he does talk about cargo cult leftism. But there is cargo cult Hindutva where people, I mean... I mean, we are Facebook friends too. So I have seen you write about this on Facebook too. And I see you get copiously abused on, on Facebook also by Cargo Cult Hindutvites. Now, how 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 do we manage to show that there is there? Because Arvindan, again, what happens is they take the cargo cult as the norm and they superimpose it at this is entire Hindutva. This is all you're capable of. Nothing else. You can't do anything else. So how do we defeat this also? How do we tackle the internal cargo cult element? And then how do we go about, because it's so good that you wrote that chapter on science and Hindutva, 
because let me tell you nobody see everybody keeps either criticizing the cargo cult or talking about the cargo cult but nobody talks about the actual work also which is done when it comes to science so maybe you can share a few excerpts of the positive bit so um number one i didn't use the term cargo cult as a derogatory term i'm not using it as a derogatory term i want to understand why our people are doing this they are our people very good natured people and then they are doing this and it uh, uh, kind of hurts me and i want to know why they are doing it okay so then i understood this you know marvin harris has written a very wonderful essay on this cargo cult and he was a marxist anthropologist marxist cultural anthropologist very interestingly and 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 he says that see this cargo cult has emerged because uh, these people understood we have contributed something to the world civilization so the world civilization has to give us back something but they are not giving us back and so they created this cargo cult during the second world war during the end of second world war and it became an important political movement also i apply the same principle here india has contributed something to the development of science and technology throughout the world but my educational system is not telling me what it is and my political movements around all the political movements around me are telling me that uh, your religion is good for nothing it is your religion is so superstitious your religion is nothing but uh, uh, anti science religion and uh, you have to throw away your religion if you want to do good science why india is lacking in science it is because of your hindu religion now when ordinary hindu to feels so upset and uh, he feels so frustrated he knows deep in his heart that we have contributed something he does not know what it is your education system is not telling it your political system is not telling it your media is not telling it so when somebody comes and says that you seen we they saw in cern they saw inside the atom and they saw nataraja dancing inside the nucleus of the atom he is ready to buy it when somebody comes and says that uh, uh, in they were listening to the cosmic uh, radiation and uh, this radiations came from another one planet and it was uh, reverberating with ohm our people buy it okay so i want very clearly to find out why this cargo cult has come so this cargo cult has come because of the continuous attacks on uh, hinduism hindu culture creating a very strong inferiority complex because of that this has come up and now with the social media this has become a contagious disease and it has created its own vested interests also now we go to the actual contributions of uh, now I, again another one important thing that you mentioned was that cargo cult leftism okay so in the case of cargo cult leftism a very typical example is this jnu students social science students telling that uh, durga was actually an aryan invader who came and uh, she was an enchantress and came and all that kind of nonsense now between the cargo cult hindutva and cargo cult leftism cargo cult hindutva is actually pseudo science it is not yet anti science in the case of cargo cult leftism it is anti human it is irrational it is racial hatred it is more dangerous this is not dangerous as it when it becomes anti science when you start talking about vedic creationism then it becomes anti science in fact i have quoted a western author who studied this and uh, not the uh, yet i think she pointed out one important thing he told that the hindutvite people given this cargo cult hindutvite so called cargo cult hindutvites even they are not taking the stand that we are against science all the way all the thing they are saying is that we already know these things these things are already there in vedas that is the maximum level they go to they don't do a sagnaik they don't tell that there is no gravity they don't tell that there is no evolution they tell that evolution is already there in the savadara that is the extent to which they go now coming to the actual contributions of uh, uh, hindutva to science and uh, i will tell you the example of uh, chandrayan the person who first gave complete support to chandrayan was dr murli manoga joshi and remember when the ganesha idols were drinking milk 
the person who came out with a statement that you should explain this only through capillarity action and nothing else was Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi. And you have Vijnan Bharati that is working on how uh, gender relations and gender representations in science institutions can be improved. No so-called right-wing party would get into this kind of thing. No right-wing, so-called right-wing movement would get into this kind of things. So here you have so-called right-wing movement talking about gender representation, proper gender representation in science for women. You have something called the TKDL, something the Murli Manohar Joshi envisioned this TKDL, Traditional Knowledge Digital Library. That reduced bio piracy. So, if you look at the way Hindutva has contributed to uh, science and technology, the improvement of science, you will find that it has contributed substantially. So, why we don't have scientific temper? Because you have succeeded in alienating the entire culture from doing science through this political slogan of scientific temper. That is the basis of this particular chapter. Fair enough. Now, Arvindan, before we wrap it up, I I have to ask you this question. This 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 book was, as you told me before the podcast, this has been a journey of now decades. That this book has been a culmination, but now the book is here. It's going to be out very soon. Um, if I would ask you, what next? Because you're going to disappear again, I know. So, so what next? <laughs> well, um, I have been thinking of uh, writing a book about how empathy has changed the way we do science, particularly biological sciences. So we have been able to move beyond the species uh, limitations that we have created ourselves. For example, we used to think that empathy belongs only to human beings. We used to think that uh, uh, work or labor belongs only to human beings. We have kind of thinking always that humans have a speciality. But then uh, more and more we do science, we realize that uh, there is nothing so special about humans. And uh, Jim's uh, show capacity to use tools. And language has been uh, taught to chimpanzees and they, they, they have created creative mistakes in using language. And uh, then you have uh, empathy being shown in non-human animals. So the next book I want to write is about this particular aspect. Fascinating. I, I really look forward to this. Uh, I remember you had uh, talking. Uh, you, you had written in Swaraja on chimps and religion, or some sort yes, of uh, exactly. proto-religious tendencies yes. in, in, on, in chimpanzees, and uh, yes. there there is some research on it. Although yeah. I think Actually, it's still Jane, the, Jane Goodall, uh, Jane Goodall first noticed, observed yeah. it. Yes. Yeah, Jane Goodall did notice it. But man, it's it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Finally, <laughs> I got to speak with you. I've been reading you for all these years. So uh, I wish you nothing but success and happiness. You are one of the rare bright lights out there in, in, in the social discourse. And uh, I, I thank you for everything you've done. And, and I wish you all the best in all your future endeavors. And once again, Arvindan, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for this wonderful dialogue. Namaste. All right, guys. So before we wrap it up, I normally, you know, I normally read an excerpt of the book from the latter half of the book. But today I'm going to start with the preface of the book. I'm going to leave you guys with, uh, uh, you know, Arvindan's words from the preface of the book. And uh, here we go. So Arvindan has written this on, I think it's page seven uh, of the book in terms of the preface or something. And it's there. It's the second page of the preface. So Arvindan says, this book is an answer to another fundamental question. Is Hindutva different from and perhaps even uh, opposed uh, to Hinduism? The answer is in a Buddhist story that is known to every Indian child. It was a bright day and a majestic swan was flying across the sky of Kapilavastu. Devadatta of the royal family, the cousin of Crown Prince Siddhartha, aimed his arrow at the bird and the arrow found its mark. 
The wounded swan, though not dead, fell to the ground. The graceful Siddhartha, even filled with compassion, embraced the wounded swan. He removed the arrow and healed it with great care. In a few weeks, the swan was well and healthy. Now Devadatta came and demanded that the swan be returned to him. After all, had it not been for his arrow, Siddhartha would not have found the swan. Siddhartha realized what would happen if the swan was given to Devadatta. He refused and took extra care of the bird. The dispute finally went to the court of the king. As the wise men of the court and the king contemplated over the situation, an old man appeared. The aura of righteousness around him was unmistakable and commanding. He declared that life does not belong to the one who was hurt, it but to the one who rescued it from a, nigh, from a near painful death experience, healed its wounds and nursed it back to a rejuvenated life. Everyone agreed and Indra, who had come disguised as an old man, disappeared. However, Siddhartha said that while the swan definitely did not belong to the one who intended to kill, hurt and injure it, it did not even belong to him who had cared for, nursed and protected it. He set free the majestic swan, Raja Hamsa, into the vast expanse of the blue sky. What is true for that Hamsa is also true for Hindu Dharma, which includes its society, its history and civilization. Hindu Dharma is the wounded swan. Hindutva is the healing care of Siddhartha. These, this was a beautiful story in the preface. And I want you guys to think about this. Think about what its essence is. Also to my left-wing viewers, I know a lot of you listen to this podcast, watch it on YouTube. I, 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 this is my attempt to reach out to you. The author that has been covered on this podcast today, this author is Hindutva. This is Hindutva. A lot of policymakers in America listen to me. This is Hindutva. Try and engage with Hindutva. I'm not saying agree with Hindutva. Try and engage with Hindutva with a steel man, not a straw man that you guys do all the time. This is an amazing book. I would urge each and every one of you, just like I was, you know, a, an evangelist of sorts of uh, Vikram Sampath's volumes on Savarkar. I'm telling you, this book is a must read if you want to understand the literal journey of Hindutva. Nobody could have done it better than Aravindan. Nobody. And I say this with all seriousness. Nobody can. I have been reading him now for years and I have never come across a more prolific writer with such capacity to read multiple fields. So in the description of the podcast, you'll find the link to the book. Go and buy it. Follow him uh, on Twitter. I know he does not interact a lot <laughs> on social media, but still go and follow him. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, please support the Charbuck podcast. Like this video. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment down there. If you want to become part of the membership program, you have Fanmo, you have YouTube, you have Patreon. You can go there. You can buy the merch. Or you can send your donations through UPI. I will see you guys next time. Until then, namaste. Take care. Bye-bye.